on just audio only? She's linked. They, they're linked all around the world to um, a very big movement all around the world on on reparations in terms of the slave trade. And so they're going after England because England was really involved in a lot of the slave trade during those early days. And so we're, we're, we're linking in because they've done a lot of research, they know um, a lot of things, they've been in negotiations uh, in the United States, in the Caribbean, in uh, throughout Europe, and so they've really mastered a lot of stuff in terms of how to go. And what they're doing is they've built this worldwide movement on reparations. And, and reparations is more than just compensation. And uh, this is what we need her to explain to us what reparations is, because we are going after reparations as well as part of the compensation package. And um, because they've done all the research, they, they understand it better, they know exactly how to, how to um, confront this. I think it's better for us to listen to someone who really knows yeah. what they're doing. Okay, well, sorry I can't see you and you can't see me, uh, but I'm very uh, thrilled to be speaking with you for the brief time that I have. I know that you've got a very tall agenda, so I'm really grateful for um, you allowing me this time to really just share in a dialogue with yourself around you know, your quest for sovereignty. And so, I'm not sure how much Pilar has mentioned, but I've, I've known Pilar for some years now, having met him first in Zimbabwe in 2004, and since that time we've been connecting around how we join our struggles. You know, there's a common struggle, we have a common enemy, and even though that struggle may often take different forms, and we may even use different terminology to be that struggle, we have one struggle. And so I know that you're really talking about solutions, how you move forward with your quest for sovereignty and everything else that goes with that. And I just wanted to make a small contribution that may or may not be useful, and it's in relation to the whole paradigm of reparations, or as I would prefer to say, reparatory justice. So. I'm a reparationist, and that basically means I'm a reparations activist, and I am very much involved with the international social movement for African reparations, and in particular the UK contingent, but it is an international movement that involves many different constituencies of African people, or people of African heritage and ancestry, and given that African people populated the globe, then that whole question of who is African is actually quite a, a broad um, question, if you like, and I'm talking about Africa in a global geopolitical context. So we have been um, championing this cause of reparatory justice, which is not only an individual human right, but it's a people's right in terms of a collective right of peoples. So according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the concept of reparations includes any measure aimed at restoring a person and or community or a people for losses, harms or damage that they have suffered, meaning we have suffered, as a result of an action or an omission of our uh, individual or human uh, peoples or even Mother Earth rights. It entails all measures aimed at restoring justice through wiping out all the consequences of the various harms suffered by the individuals and or people concerned. The right to reparation is a fundamental right of general international law. Global and regional human rights instruments expressly guarantee the right to a remedy for violations. In most cases, this consists of both the procedural right to a fair hearing and the substantive right to reparations. Reparations should be adequate, meaning full, in the sense that they should wipe out all of the consequences derived from a wrongdoing, injury, loss, damage, harm or violations perpetrated against conquered, victimized, or oppressed peoples. They should be effective 
meaning that they must be efficient in restoring the people harmed or violated in a holistic but also a transformative way, including spiritually, socially, materially, morally, uh, culturally, and also in terms of economic terms. And reparation should re-establish the pre-existing situation. So that means reparation should really put us back in the position we would have been but for enslavement, colonialism, neo-colonialism, imperialism, genocide, uh, anti-black racism, and the list goes on. Reparation should also be prompt and proportional to the gravity of the harm suffered by the people affected. And reparation should include measures of restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition. So that is a basic introduction to reparations. And there's something called the United Nations Basic Principles and Guidelines on the right to a remedy and reparation for victims of violations of international human rights law and humanitarian law. And they currently uh, clarify the international legal principles and the emerging norms about reparations. And I feel there's a lot that we can take from this framework, not just because it's the UN framework, but because this framework has been forged in the crucible of people's struggles to basically advance our human rights and our collective rights as people. So our peoples throughout the world, our original peoples, Aboriginal peoples, Indigenous peoples, um, Native peoples, African heritage peoples, have helped to shape this framework, as well as other peoples who've experienced any form of historical or contemporary injustice. So that is really kind of the operational definition of reparations. Uh, It's holistic. When the word reparations gets used, uh, people often uh, make it synonymous with money or financial compensation. But as I've just shared with you, compensation is only one aspect of reparation on the international law. Now, reparations must also entail restoring indigenous knowledge systems of language, spirituality and philosophy, music, art and civilism, as well as science and technology, resulting in the first peoples and nations, the original peoples, the indigenous peoples of the world, uh, redefining the knowledge systems that we work with and work from. So then we come to the question of reparations for what? And I guess in your case, you know your case better than I or anyone else. But, you know, some things come to mind. So for the loss of self-determination, for conquest, for the loss of sovereignty, for cultural loss, for the rupture of your various collective structures, all the structures that kind of keep you whole as a people. Uh, for psychological and psychosocial damage, for the massacres of our people, for the epistemicide, the ecocide, the damage to the environment, uh, destruction, damage, and dispossession of culture and and our heritage, dispossession of our land uh, and resources, as well as ethnocide and cultural genocide and genocide, and in fact, even humanicide. And we can take some guidance from Human Rights Watch, who in 2001 stated that when addressing relatively old wrongs, that we should base the claims of reparations not on the past abuse itself, but on its contemporary effects. That is, that we would focus on people who can reasonably claim that today they personally suffer the effects of past human rights violations through continuing economic or social deprivation. So that is the whole question of reparations for what? And in fact, in the African case, 
our case is premised on reparations for genocide and the way in which that genocide is continuing to actually, um, you know, harm our life chances, affect our ability to live our lives as whole persons with dignity even today. Uh, but when thinking about reparations, it's important to go through your own history and look at all of the wrongs, all of the harms, all of the violations, and literally just add it up. Because oftentimes when we talk about reparations, we limit it. We limit it to very simplistic terms. And reparations are not a simplistic remedy. They are complex. They are multifaceted. And it is important for us to have a full accounting of the debt. And the debt is not just a financial debt. There's a moral debt. There's a spiritual debt. There's a cultural debt. And there's so many debts, actually. And we need to add that all up. And so I think that the whole reparations framework is something that may be useful to yourself. And I know that there have been... Uh, some, you know, Aboriginal peoples and Indigenous peoples who have utilised reparations as a framework to accompany the struggles for the re-establishment of sovereignty, um, your, the re-establishment of your pre-colonial nations and nationhood and personhood and your personality as distinct peoples. Uh, also, in terms of the struggle to effectively decolonise. Because the key aspect of reparations that is kind of really underemphasized is the question of uh, cessation of violations and guarantees of non-repetition. So it's no point just trying to put a plaster on the sore, as it were. Reparations should result in a transformed people, a transformed humanity, and uh, ensuring that we create the uh, circumstances and the political environment whereby what has happened to us as colonized peoples who are still being colonized never happens again and never happens again not only to us you know in terms of our own physical selves but also in terms of posterity and that's why uh, we learn a lot from the struggles of indigenous peoples of the continent of so-called America but as they call Abiyalala and they talk about a seven generations principle uh, in particular the Iroquois nation and they say that when we're thinking about what would be an effective settlement what would be a holistic settlement we have to look at what the policy or the program or whatever it is we think is enough, what impact will that have on us, our peoples, seven generations for today, from today? And so that helps us think about reparations as being, um, you know, transgenerational because the original injuries, the original violations of our people's uh, rights, uh, the original uh, violations of our sovereignty and our self-determination happened to our foreparents, our ancestors. So we also have to look at what would justice look like for them, but equally, what does justice look like for our posterity and for the generations that need to come? So it's that sense of uh, cyclical time that we are not just who we are in this as we stand here today, that we are a representation of all that has gone before us. And we are also a representation of all those that are going to come out of us in terms of our lineages. Um, so those are some of the sort of basic um, aspects around reparations. I know I don't have much time left, but just in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to share with you just a few um, perspectives from our own struggle uh, as, as African people, people of African heritage and ancestry. So PARCO is a coalition that I represent, and it stands for the Pan-African Reparations Coalition in Europe. And in our PARCO perspective, we talk about Pan-African Reparations for Global Justice. And what that means is that we have to ensure as African people uh, that 
some of the oldest people on the planet, that our repair process, our reparation process, is, cannot just be for ourselves. And that is why we talk about global justice, because you can do reparations in such a way that you end up causing harm or dispossessing other people, yes? So the whole Israel-Palestine situation comes to mind here. And that is why we emphasize reparating justice, and in fact, global justice, because we want to ensure that the world, the post-reparations world order, is a fundamentally trans you know, transformed world, because it's no point thinking that we can just repair ourselves with any group of people in a corner somewhere and leave the rest of humanity in disrepair, because those same people will come back and undo the gains of our own uh, people's repair process. And so it means that we have to have a vision that is about restoring um, not only ourselves, but actually taking humanity forward. And I think that's one thing that has always come out of our people's collective struggles, that we have had to take the moral high ground to actually chart a new path and a new destiny so that we can ensure that we can eliminate the degradations, the enslavements, the oppressions, the, uh, you know, all of the dispossessions and everything that goes with that that have happened not only to ourselves but other people. So we say that receiving the financial component of reparations will be meaningful only if it serves the holistic purpose and strengthens the integral whole of our people's self-repair process. Although no sum of money could ever erase our pain or wash away the blood of our glorious ancestors and what they shed at the hands of their enslavers, we must have all that is necessary for restoring ourselves and future generations to the correct pan-African heights of global justice for all. And so when we think about what would reparations look like, it's important for you to sort of go through, you know, the whole thing around restitution. So what, what would be measures of restitution for Aboriginal peoples? Um, what would that mean in terms of restitution of lands, of territories, of resources, of ancestral remains, of, of language, of culture, of identity, of, of belonging, of citizenship? There's a whole list. What would compensation look like? And compensation is not just about money. It's actually putting a, if you like, material value on damage. So what is the cost of loss of access to lands? And having now multinational corporations, mining corporations, basically mine the earth. Um, you know, perpetrating other acts of, of basically ecocide against Mother Earth. There's a cost to that. What is the cost to our mental health um, as a result of removing children from their families and basically, um, you know, deracinating them and raising them, um, you know, so that they are, uh, they have a, a natal alienation are not able to connect with their own identity and culture. There's a cost to that. What is the cost of discrimination in employment and in public services and so forth? There's a cost to that. So all of that comes into compensation. And then when we think about rehabilitation, let's look at what is the psychosocial impact of, of you know, dispossession, of colonization, of genocide, of ethnocide on your peoples? And then how would we remedy that? How would we ensure that we can build strong families and communities as part of our peoplehood and our quest to restore our nationhood? How do we ensure that we can develop health services that, uh, you know, reflect cultural competence and cultural safety and actually our own people's cosmo visions of what it means to be healthy, what it means to be successful, what it means to be whole. Satisfaction are all those measures that we would put in place to feel satisfied that there's been justice, holistic transformative justice 
You know, it includes changing curriculums, um, removing uh, statutes of colonizers and genocidaires and, um, you know, rewriting the sort of national history so that no, people no longer uh, have this notion that somehow Australia belongs to those people that have actually colonized you there. So there's a lot to be done in our satisfaction. Um, it might also include how do we uh, hold violators and perpetrators to account. And then finally, there's guarantees of non-repetition, which are the most important, I feel, because the guarantees of non-repetition are what do we need to put in place to ensure that what has happened to us, what has happened to you, never, ever happens again. And that's where we have to have big thinking, um, because I think that's, you know, that is what is required of us. So reparations then is also about us restoring our agency because part of what colonization does, it makes us feel powerless. And in fact, it does, you know, make, uh, it dehumanizes us and it does kind of take away our people's power and capacity to kind of chart a path, an independent, self-determined path of, you know, our own people's recovery. But we have to now move into a phase of what we call reparatory justice enforcement, where it's no longer about saying to the colonizers that you owe us or you have to do this for us. Reparations enforcement is a 21st century reparations activism paradigm. So it's about being armed with our rights, the various declarations, the various um, struggles for freedom and what we've achieved. Um, in terms of changing our people's condition, and it's moving them from a position of simply advocating reparations or reparatory justice to that of enforcing our human, our people's, and our mother right, earth rights to be repaired. We now have to move to a place of enforcing our rights, claiming our rights, and not actually waiting for someone to do it for us. We have to take charge of our own repair process because in repairing ourselves, that should also be done in such a way that it repairs those who have even injured us. Yes, because we know that no nation that enslaves another, that colonizes another, that terrorizes another can itself be truly free. So that is, I guess, what I just wanted to share with you and to just let you know that in the UK, um, we work in a, in a very pan-Africanist way as African people, but we also work with many allied struggles for reparatory justice of non-African people. And so that is why we are prioritizing the building of what's called the Pepperine, the People's Reparations International Movement. And that's basically everyone else on the planet who has a reparations struggle. Because ultimately, even some of the goals that we as African people are seeking, they are fundamental, you know, they are systemic transformation, structural change. They cannot just happen with African people. They're going to happen with African people working with other peoples of conscience from around the world who want similar things, who are fighting for some of the same changes that we are fighting for. And I think that then brings us into the realm of how we do solidarity. How do we work on our struggles that may seem distinct, but how do we work on our struggles in such a way that there is reciprocity and that we can work in the UK, highlighting your plight because we are also fighting the same people here in the UK and globally. But we can also wage our struggle in such a way that we amplify voices of those of you who are in resistance over there. And vice versa, I think this is an important role of the PRID, the People's Corporations International Movement, because we have to begin to envision a post-reparations world order. And as you are becoming, uh, more and more of your nations will declare sovereignty. We have similar struggles around sovereignty on our mother continent, Africa. And in fact, those of us who are in exile, Africans in exile like myself, we also have a, a unique status where we are seeking 
you know, to be included in a new African nation uh, that doesn't currently exist. And so we have a vision of a transformed African continent that we call Ma'at Ubuntu. And that basically means an Africa that is premised on the ancient Kemetan, or what you might know as Egyptian, uh, philosophical and ethical ideal of uh, Ma'at, which talks about truth, you know, justice, reciprocity, um, fairness, balance, order, and harmony, and also Ubuntu that comes out of the experience of the peoples of Southern Africa that means I am because we are. And that literally we are people or we become people through our interconnection with other people. And so we have a philosophy and a worldview that recognizes the interconnectivity of not only the African struggle, but the struggles of all the First Nations and all the Aboriginal peoples, all the indigenous, the indigenous peoples of the earth. And we have factored that in in terms of how we conceptualize the repair and some of the strategies that we are adopting. And one of the strategies is around um, delegitimizing the practice of unjust law, because we know that law um, was used as a tool in our people's conquest um, all over the earth. And so the use of law is one of the most important instruments in our struggle for preparatory justice. Indeed, the need to locate our claim to restitution for the damages caused by the gross violations of our people's sovereignty must raise immediately for us the essential questions of whose framework, whose law, and whose justice. And those, those words come from my colleague, Kofi Clue, who is a co-vice chair of PARCO with myself. And Kofi wrote a very well-known paper in 1993 at a famous uh, reparations conference that we had in the UK. And he spoke about some of the principles that we needed to implement in determining what he called an African path of legal struggle for reparations. And what he means is that we use the, the law as a tool of resistance in our people's struggle because it has been used as a tool to oppress us. And there are seven approaches that he talks about. One is to demystify the law, so that law is not seen as something sacrosanct and above our people, but we must see ourselves again as makers and shapers and implementers of just law. We need legal creativity, so it means that we don't just accept the legal status quo. We need a popular democratic involvement of our people in the lawmaking process. So it's no longer this thing about the experts sitting on high and we are just somehow subjects. Or we need recognition of the criminal injustice of enslavement, colonization, and neo-colonization from the perspective of the legal consciousness of our people not from the legal consciousness of our enslavers and our tormentors. Five, we need to judge the crimes and wrongs of enslavement and colonization and genocide, etc., in accordance with our own sovereign law, our own people's law, not Eurocentric law and law of imperialism that has been globalized. Six, we need to promote mass adjudication of African and, he said, other indigenous people's cases for reparations, the grassroots benches of what he terms an international people's tribunal on crimes against humanity. And we have now developed that notion of a, a people's tribunal to something called the Ubuntu Rotler, which is basically a court of our people's humanity and interconnectedness. And seven, we need international legal strategies on the formulation and prosecution of our people's case. And so yeah, a lot of our work is in the realm of what we call um, legal cares, because we believe the law itself needs to be repaired. And it is often an instrument that oppressed peoples go to 
as a way of finding justice. And a lot of the time we are left wanting with what we find in other people's sense of law. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to share with you. And I guess I just need to close out with a quote um, from somebody called Professor Kimwezu. And um, he is a person who conceptualized a very holistic notion of uh, reparation as being about repairs and what he calls holistic repairs. And, um, you know, he talks about um, health repairs, psychological repairs, mental repairs, self-made repairs, social repairs, institutional repairs, technological repairs, economic, political, educational repairs. Basically, repairs every type that we need to recreate our societies. But Jim Reason says this, he says, let me repeat that the most important aspect of reparation is not the money the campaign may or may not bring. The most important part of reparation is our self-repair, the change it will bring about in our understanding of our history, of ourselves and of our destiny, the chance it will bring about in terms of our place in the world. He says, we who are campaigning for reparations cannot hope to change the world without changing ourselves. We cannot hope to change the world without changing our ways of seeing the world, our ways of thinking about the world, our ways of organizing our world, our ways of working and dreaming in our world. All of these are norms change for the better. The type of black man, black woman, black person that was made by the Holocaust, that was made to feel inferior by slavery and colonization, and then was steeped in colonial attitudes and values, that type of black person will not be able to bring about the post-reparations global order without changing profoundly in the process that has begun. That type of black will not even be appropriate for the post-reparations global order unless thoroughly and suitably reconstructed. So, reparation, like charity, must begin in ourselves. The making of the new black person with the making of a new black world. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, we will talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.